Pele, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast. And I'm Rich Collins, Fly Fishing Correspondent and General Nerd. Oh, good. And hey, welcome to the show. This show is all about fish, fishing, and eating fish. And anything is fair game. And it's a good bet that you're going to want to trim your cat's hairs to make lures after listening to this week's show. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> My uh, cat, if I had one, would not be happy about that. Oh, uh, I'm already, like, so I'm, I'm starting fly fishing this year, and I'm already looking at, around my yard, at my chickens, at my dog, my kids, my wife, and thinking, what can I use to catch a fish with? <laughs> you do want the, like, fine belly hair of kitty. <laughs> that nice, soft, soft kitty hair. Well, we're getting a kitten, I think, next week, so I think that is, uh, it's going to be great. And we, my wife just um, bought a robot vacuum. And I think, I know, a little Roomba, and we named it Rosie. And I think it's going to pick up enough hair off the floor for me to get all the fly tying materials I need. Oh, this is totally off topic, but you know what happens if it finds kitty poo, right? No, what happens? <laughs> I, I need to know. It smears it all over the entire house. Oh, beautiful thing. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely supportive of, of cats in the house. Or Roombas. Uh, Roombas I am supportive of. I think they're awesome. <laughs> this is not our first robot vacuum. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had, to put our, we, we had to put our first robot vacuum down about three years ago. Um, <laughs> it was a very sad day in our household. I bought it for my wife for, um, I think, Valentine's Day a bunch of years ago. And uh, it served us really well, but it got old and, you know, couldn't repair it anymore. So <laughs> we finally yeah. adopted a new one. <laughs> and we're, uh, we're already in love, and it's so cute. <laughs> we have to talk about fishing, but for Valentine's Day, a, a robot vacuum? Seriously? Yeah. Have you been married as long as me? Uh, no. Do you have kids? No. Okay. We, we having, we're having a completely different marriage. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you don't get to fish, which makes a lot of sense, I which get is to, why I get to fish pretty you, much daily. You get to fish as much as you want, and there's a lot of other things that you get to do with your wife that I don't. So, you know, there's advantages to not having kids. So there's that. You know. <laughs> All right, let's start All right. the show. <laughs> All right, hey, this episode is brought to you by you, our listeners. Um, this is just so it's, this show is entirely crowdfunded by Patreon.com, um, which is where listeners or fans can go to the website and donate as little as a dollar show to help keep the show funded. And it really does matter. Right now, um, we are making just barely enough money to cover all of our fees to run the Fish Nerds Media Empire, uh, and we could use more help. So if you want to support the Fish Nerds, go to, go to fishnerds.com slash Patreon and help us crowdfund the show. We're looking for a dollar an episode, four bucks a month. I'll send you some cool decals, and I'll be your best friend if you support us. <laughs> and if you support us at the $25 level, I'll mention your business on the show. And we have one supporter giving us 25 bucks a week. It's not bad. That, that's, that's an amazing amount of money, to be honest. For just a fan. Uh, and that's Josh Lopes, and his website is lopestax.com. And he's out of Hanover, Massachusetts, and he's a great guy. And if you need a tax guy or a nerd, uh, he's your nerd. So nice. that's Josh Lopes. We have lots of other Patreon subscribers, and we appreciate every one of them. And uh, stickers are coming out this week, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I signed up, and I, I don't know, uh, I, I don't really know when it charges my card. It's great. I just kind of just rolls with it. <laughs> well, you know, the, the nice thing about it being only like $4 a month is it, it doesn't hurt anybody. You know, it's not painful. You're not getting charged, you know, $100 a month. It's 4 bucks, And so it's not enough where it hurts your bank account, but when a lot of people do it, it really helps out the fish nerds, and, and it makes a big difference. I mean, honestly, the show would not be around still if it weren't for our Patreon subscribers, so... You're not already there. Crowdfunding. You know, that's the modern economy. It's, it's crazy, yeah. You have to support the things you like or they disappear now. So yeah. It's really odd. And, so. you know, we give you a dollar of uh, fishy talk a week. I mean, a dollar's worth of fishy talk a week. I think that's the, <laughs> the motto. So that should be our new motto. One dollar worth of episode <laughs> fun a week. Oh, that's, yeah. yeah that's, I that's buy cool. that for a dollar. <laughs> what can you buy for a dollar? Not that much. lasts an hour. Yeah. Nothing. No, I, I bought a woolly bugger fly today. It cost me $3. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tie your own. There you go. Cat's hair. Cat's hair. Cat. Yeah. Chase that cat. Black works good, but green. I don't know where you're going to get green. Uh, we can just color it in. 
So. Sharpie. Sharpie yeah. does everything. So, so Rich, you are, you've been fishing with us a lot this year. We've really had a good time ice fishing all winter, your first winter as an ice fisher. But, yeah. Oh, but fly yeah, fishing yeah. is kind of your gig, right? I would say so. I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert. I keep saying that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot of listeners that are experts, but I think we have a lot more that aren't. Yeah. So I think it's a good mix. Um, what I'm doing is just kind of focusing on it. I enjoy it. Um, it's more challenging, certainly at times. Um, like tonight, I was out on a pond here nearby, and it was excruciating. The the fish were uh, chasing rising midges, these little tiny flies, and they were only chasing them if they were coming straight up off the bottom, and then kind of getting stuck in the surface film. So you have to emulate this this like straight up little nymph on a on a floating line, and it's like it's crazy it was when you get down to these little nymphs. So um, it's really challenging. It makes you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> I can sometimes. I can imagine, and and that's my biggest problem with fly fishing is whenever I do it, I can see the fish, I know they're there, and I know if I put a worm on my hook, I'm going to catch the fish. <laughs> and the do I want to yeah. power through being unsuccessful, or do I want to catch a fish? That's the gamble. I'm always like, ah, what am I right. going to do? And I think that is yeah. There's there's a, d a couple different ways to fish. There's you know, fish will are opportunistic when they see bait or they see worms, which is essentially bait, um, or anything organic like that that's not in their feeding pattern. They'll take it, or they'll, f or they'll hit out of aggression. Mm -hmm. They'll bite things out of aggression, or they'll be tuned into that that whatever that food supply is, which tonight was really annoying little midges, mm -hmm. um, and they won't they won't take anything else. So I I often wonder if a worm would even work because they're so tuned into what they've been eating. Um, but right. it, it it would work. It's cool. It would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Again, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and, and I and I'm gonna try really hard this year to leave my worms at home and leave my spinning rod at home when I go fly fishing, so I don't give up so fast. Because this year's my year to learn how to catch a fish on a fly. I bought a new fly rod. I went to North Country Angler, bought a brand new rod and reel, set and he set nice. me up. He gave me a handful of flies, and uh, this is my year. In fact, tomorrow morning. Before work, I'm going to go out and hit a local river and see what I can do. I, I walked around one tonight and found some good pools I can check out. So we'll give it a go. But I have a woolly bugger. I should have got midge flies. Well, they're exasperating. Woolly buggers are the worm of uh, fly fishing. They'll take just about anything, anytime. So. Yeah. Now, can I put a worm on the woolly bugger? No, I don't. I mean, you could, but it just kind of defeats the purpose of the fly at all. Just use a worm. Right. <laughs> the, the woolly bugger is a, is a leech and or a minnow and or a stone fly. It's any it's any it's just an all purpose fly that emulates those things. So fish see it and they just um, they can't help themselves. It's a lot of protein. It's a juicy meal and they mm -hmm. just bang it. Um, so delicious. if you put a worm on it, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, it will look different, but it will taste better. Right. Well, that's what's important. I, I mean, catching fish is what's important. So, But you've been fly fishing a lot already this spring and you've been out oh, to Lake yeah, Winnipesaukee yeah. and you've, you've caught salmon this year? Yep. I've been out uh, in Winnie in the Bay. I've been in some of the rivers. I've caught salmon, rainbow trout, some really big rainbows early on in the year. Um, early on in the season. It was a lot of fun. I took our friend, uh, friend fellow fish nerd Vinny mm -hmm. out for a day on the river. And he's like, uh, I don't want to use the word idiot savant, but it's a lot like when he ice fishes, he focuses, he does what he's supposed to do and he catches fish. So he outfished me his first day with a fly rod. Mm -hmm. um, I think he got three fish and I got two, but you know, hey. Yeah, I um, find fishing with Vinny to be infuriating. <laughs> I uh, I like Vinny, but um, he is totally like like this autistic angler. Like he just he just picks it. And I'm not talking about spectrumy. I'm talking all the way autistic. He just knows <laughs> like like there's no there's no swaying him from his focus. <laughs> you know he's right. He's that like was the thing. yeah. <laughs> he's like the he's rain the man of fishing. Yeah, and yeah. it wasn't like uh, you, you you see this. Uh, so salmon are pretty pretty. Um, tuned into very certain things and they only like a perfect drift of a tiny little midge fly mm -hmm. at certain times. So he figured that out. Um, but there's guys all up and down the river doing the exact same thing. It's like dappling. It's almost like Tenkari. Just put it up river, let it flow down as perfect drift and then repeat. And you do it in the same spots because the fish are, um, they're not going to pick it up. 
one out of a hundred times they might pick it up. So Vinny not only figured that out, but he also went and started figuring out where the holes were and where the feeding pattern holes were. And like, I see him over like, there's fish right here. I can feel him. And then he'd fish that hole. So um, it was a good learning experience. I mean, he did a really good job. So. Yeah, he was pretty was, pleased. He kept texting. I was, uh, I was in South Carolina not catching fish. And he kept sending me photos of these fish. And I was like, God. <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, I think he left one day, and they were, again, these midges, these midges drive me crazy. They were jumping and flipping and flying through the air, and no, none of the guys were catching them. There's, you know, there's guys everywhere, and nobody was catching them because no one could get that small fly to do whatever they were tuned in on. So, But, yeah, it's, it's nice here. Um, I've never gotten into the salmon fishing in New Hampshire because there's only a few spots to do it. It's very crowded. It's very busy. There's lots of guys doing lots of different things. But I got to say, everybody's been respectful, nice, friendly, helpful. It's been a really good year, and I don't remember it always being that way. So um, I, it's, it's great. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of guys that will help. Newbies, there's a lot of guys that still have their secret honey holes. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it's good, you know. I think it's great. There aren't a lot of salmon, as we know from earlier episodes where uh, Fishing Game was talking about how it's a limited resource. So, um, But it's great to have. I mean, they're amazing fish. They fight like crazy. And they're uh, they're just cool. Chrome fish are cool. Right. So. Well, their Latin names, uh, Samo Solar, means the jumper, right? So they can jump 12 feet out of the water if they want to. So they really do have that powerful fight in them. And that kind of is the attraction. The yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And outsmarting them. And, you know, that's where that's where I point to, to Vinny. I like, I've talked about it before. I like a, an aggressive hammering, you know, f fish flying, fish water blowing out of everything. And he um, has kind of figured out this little... You know, same as ice fishing, this little tick, like yeah. this perfect little take, and he knows it. And uh, I think that's what would make a good salmon fisherman, so I'm, okay. I'm half good. You're half good. Now, um, <laughs> I, I asked you to come up with five uh, flies every freshwater fisher needs. So I'm brand new at ice uh, fishing, I uh, fly fishing, and I'm at the fly shop, and the guy there is trying to sell me, Steve, he's trying to sell me 40 kinds of flies. <laughs> I want to ignore him and say, Rich said, here are the five flies I need with me. What are those five flies? Oh, okay, good. Well, I carry about a thousand flies. I protect them like my children, even right. though I don't have children. Right. Um, but I use pretty much the same fly over and over again <laughs> because they work. Right. That's, so. I, I, by the way, I'm reading uh, John Garrick's book right now, and that he says the exact same thing. And he goes, and enough. Flies abhor a vacuum, so an empty pocket will find itself full of flies, even though you never use any of them. <laughs> so. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm listening to that, too, on audio, but I didn't get very far. Yeah. Um, so I only know the east, um, the northeast in particular, this area, although I don't think it's much different. There are some different flies out west in particular, but I think most of the northeast has the same kind of roll call of flies and the, and the first one and the most important one um would be the elk hair caddis which if you look it up online or if you have one it's nothing more than a little tuft of deer hair um that just kind of resembles to the fish below wings of mm -hmm. any kind and caddis have those neat kind of winged bodies where they close their wings back so they look like a little cone yeah they're but, cool um, they're cool insects caddis flies yeah and there's thousands of them so here in, in new hampshire in particular that's pretty much the only really serious fly we have that's um that lasts month to month so there's not like one hatch there's pretty much always caddis hatching so that's a staple um cheap fly kind of a pain to tie yourself so <laughs> i wouldn't recommend it um and then just a couple different colors black Black and tan is pretty much all you need, and uh, perfect fly. It's really nice because you can dry it out, put a little goop on it, throw it out, put it on the water as a surface fly, and let it either drift or just sit there, and they'll take it. And you can also um, strip the line quickly and get it underwater so it pops in and out of the water. So you do a fast strip, and it goes underwater, and then it floats back up to the top. Um, so it's a great fly. It's very versatile. You can do almost anything with it, and you can skitter it. They love, wild, especially wild fish. What is love skittering? Skitter. So it's oh, it's hard to explain. Basically, don't you use words you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> pull your rod tip up in the air and just very lightly um, draw it across the top of the water on the surface film. So oh, um, skittering. 
Yeah, yeah. you just want to kind of make it uh, <laughs> like hydroplane, actually. So you don't want it below the surface. You don't want it on the surface. You just want it like skittering off the top. and Because um, that's what the flies do when they lay eggs. They, they kind of hop and skitter their way. They put their butt on the, or their little egg-laying butt. They, they skitter across the water because they don't want to get eaten by the fish. They know the fish are there. Mm -hmm. So they do this little dance. And if you can emulate that, they go crazy because they, they look for that. It must be so mm -hmm. fun, too. Like, even if you don't catch a fish, you see them exploding out trying to catch that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I yeah, I like dry flies. Um, so I'll care caddis. You'll find them everywhere. They're, they're, they're cheap, usually, and I uh, can't have enough of them. Second one... Um, probably catch the most fish on this one is a black woolly bugger. Mm -hmm. It is all purpose. Like I, I think I mentioned before, it's a leech. It's a, it's a fish. It's a minnow. It's a uh, stone fly. It's pretty much anything. I personally like them with cone heads, gold cone heads, um, and a lot of rubber legs. They're hard to find, but there's something about it. It's hairy. It's big. It's meaty. They go crazy for well, it. Well, the, 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 the legs like must make it like a helgramite almost, right? I mean, yeah, that's... yeah, or a stonefly. Um, but the big stoneflies, and, and it's just protein, and it's just big and hairy, and it could be anything. I use those, and then I hang a, uh, a nymph, which is the third fly, a beadhead nymph. I like the beadheads because they have a little more action which is the, the tiny stuff, um, not midge tiny, but, you know, small, and a gold ribs, gold ribbed hare's ear or prince nymph would be the two that I would say they're pretty ubiquitous. They are just uh, insects that crawl on the bottom of the uh, stream that float up to the top to hatch. They just look like um, little tiny nothing when, when they rise they're hard to see but they often emit an air bubble oh cool That's how they get to the top so that bead head somehow looks like an air bubble on top of a, a little little tiny uh, nymph or going up to the surface of the water so those are um pretty common That's not my favorite to fish them they're kind of a pain to fish like i was talking about but uh you gotta have them they're just one of the big major food well they work sources. <laughs> So that's yeah, important. they work in, in there. In their, just like I said, um, for dry flies, the parachute atoms uh, here in New England, I think everybody could just live on a couple flies, Alcaric Addis, and a parachute atoms, which is a um, it's a mayfly pattern. It's not really specific to anything. It doesn't even have to be the right size, but mayflies are those really cool looking everything, you know, all the logos and all the. Um, Fly fishing branded stuff is a mayfly. It's a very cool looking fly. Uh, parachute Adams kind of sits in the water a little bit. The parachute, which is the wing um, that's brought around in a circle around the fly, so it sits flat on the water. It works great. There's a lot of other mayflies, thousands of mayflies. That's half a fly shop is these perfect mayflies to match a perfect hatch. But, um, you know, Parachute Adams works really well anytime you see mayflies. So... Three flies you should know, I mean three insects you should know, is the woolly bugger type, um, which is a stone fly, the caddis fly, and the mayfly. Those are your, your three flies to pay yep. attention to. When I studied um, aquatic invertebrates in college, the textbook I had on the bottom of each page actually had the fly pattern of the invertebrate we were studying, just as an ancillary, like... Just in case you want to see it. <laughs> and, nice. and, it and it was really cool. I wish I had the book still. I lost the book, but it was, it was like a $200 textbook too. But so as I was <laughs> learning about each stonefly, you know, um, Pearl of Day being my favorite, big, the, that's that big yellow one with all the black spots on it. It had the yep. fly pattern on the bottom of the book. And that's like that. It's like two inch long stonefly. It's like such a nice looking piece of meat. Yeah, and I think uh, I think the real fly snobs are very into matching the mayfly exactly. And I mean, if you do it on the water, you're golden. They'll hit nonstop. But you know, they're it's like a it's a guessing game. Yeah. Plus, <laughs> is it close enough? And is the fish hungry enough? Yeah. And, plus, they're fish, and they're gonna eat. <laughs> so. I know you always call fish dumb, but my God, they're smart sometimes. Well, or they're stubborn. Maybe might be the better. Maybe one. they're maybe picky. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> picky, yeah. And then the last one would be um, a very simple one, the San Juan worm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a fly I use a lot because I find it kind of boring to use. It's just like fishing a worm. You can use a bobber, which we in the uh, fly fishing world called a strike indicator. Snob. Um, <laughs> it is a bobber. <laughs> it's fancy neon colors, and you get like nine of them for $10. 
unlike, you know, the red and white kids bobbers. So you have to pay more because, you know, fly it's fly fishing. But, yeah, you hang that off the, and then drift it in the current, and it's, you know, they love worms, just like we were talking about. Yeah. And if you get really fancy, you can trail uh, a San Juan with an egg fly, and that's called a spaghetti and meat. Oh, that's, this is going to be, this is going to be my favorite one, I think. <laughs> um, works great if there's, if there's eggs in the water. I'll tell you. The, so I, 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 I one one year decided to be a fly fisher. This is about ten years ago, maybe more now. And I, t- I the only fly I was able to tie was was the San Juan worm, <laughs> and I tied it with it. It was just a green piece of string on a hook. <laughs> and the usual starter. Yeah. I took it crappie fishing, and it was more effective than any worm or any other jig I've ever used crappie fishing. And it was every time I lined the water, a fish came out. It's just yeah, that's stupid, <laughs> stupid easy, and I was so happy. Yep. So, yeah, I'm giving away all the secrets, but a lot of guys use a lot of these same flies and, you know, pretend that they're doing something amazing. But it's really like shiner, worm, or, you know, power bait. You've got your three whatever spin casting that are go-tos, but... Um, so that's that. And then there's one more that I've started to find more and more of is, is nymphs that look like they're, they're set on jig flies. Mm-hmm. They're inverted. They've got a weighted head. So they're like nymphs that you can jig through the water. So they've got more action. Those, there's one in particular called the Duracell. It's got UV fiber in it. I don't know what the fish see in the UV or how it looks different, but they, they love that. So that's something kind of new uh, as, a, as an extra if you see those jig uh, nymphs. They're good to have. And then the rest is all really based on hatch. And, you know, if you're going to go somewhere you're not familiar with, you go to the fly shop and you ask what's what's going on. But give um, them still give them yeah. money. They'll give you info. Yeah, yeah. hopefully if they like you. <laughs> if they if like you pass you. all their tests, it's like it's like a, it's like a dating audition. Oh, and some of them have a lot of tests. I'm learning quickly about uh, <laughs> fly fishing snobbery. I uh, will. We'll talk more about that later, <laughs> but hey, let's let's talk about you. You had a chance to go visit our friends over at Post Flybox. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know they were a um, local to me company. They're down in uh, the North Shore, Massachusetts, which is like a half hour from me. Um, I'd seen their ads up and down, left and right, um, all social media all the time. They've got great great visuals, and they've got cool pictures, and they've got great stickers, and uh, you know, I was like. I want that, but then I looked at my fly box just over overflowing with stuff that I never use because I don't tie a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never joined, or I, I would have. I certainly would love to. Um, but I got in touch with them just to say, hey, I'm, I'm curious what's going on, your local company, what's going, uh, you know, what got you here, what's this idea? And uh, they said, yeah, come come down, see, this, see the operation, and let's chat. So that's exactly what I did. I sat in a room with... Um, pretty much the whole company, if not the whole company, which is six or seven people, uh, they do it all out of this little warehouse space, and uh, we had a nice talk. It's it's uh, a lot about kind of the business. It's not so much about fishing, and because they kind of never get to go out fishing because they're always working on the business. So um, I did <laughs> I did notice that it's just a, it's a, a conversation among people that are into fishing that want to make some money doing it. So. I thought it was good. I thought it was a good model. Perfect. They're, they're the kings of the fly box. They're the original, I think, and the ones that have ha- had the longevity. So, yeah, it's a great little chat. Oh, here it is. All right, Fish Nerd Nation. I am here at Post Fly, north of Boston, south of New Hampshire, with a bunch of uh, guys and gals that started a. I'll let them explain exactly how to describe it, but it's basically a home subscription to fly tying materials. Let's talk a bit about what you guys do and, and how you're trying to do it. I'm Brian. I started the company three and a half years ago uh, in my basement, and I ha- I guess I do a little bit of everything here, and um, with the help of uh, my three amigos. So we're our our kind of mission is to be the easiest way for an angler to get what they need to be successful on the water period right so um it could be fly tying kits like you mentioned or finished flies we also yeah. started the business on us uh, with the, the kits uh, containing finished flies not actually just oh, fly oh, stuff. Okay. so yeah so basically what we do is um a customer comes to our site and they create a profile uh and um they tell us what they like to fish for and where they fish for it so um we are then able to choose flies um 
that we know are going to uh, work for them. So we do fl uh, trout flies. Uh, obviously, um, we do uh, like bass and warm water, uh, water style flies. We do saltwater flies, and we do steelhead flies. And we also do um, uh, those variations as tying kits as well. So if you want to tie your own, we'll send you all the materials and hooks and stuff and recipes to actually go and, uh, and tie your own. Again, and it's all uh, based on uh, on the uh, uh, fish that you're uh, hunting. So you're trying to do a whole home delivery of fishing? Everything, yeah. Exactly. Flies, stickers, leader, gear in your box every month. Everything you need to go, you know, get the box in the mail, go fishing, hit the water that day, and catch fish yeah. that day. Right, right. That's our goal. And um, just to describe the scene, I'm sure everybody can hear the construction equipment moving around. We're in a pretty cool little warehouse type thing, um, typical startup. Fly rods on the walls, guitars around, piles of uh, machinery, and lots and lots of fly tying materials. So um, it's it's definitely a startup entrepreneurial thing. This is not a big business. In my mind, I pictured this as maybe a spinoff of I don't puck what feathers or something. You know, you don't know. You see the ads on on, on Facebook, and you go, I wonder who's behind that. And you, you know, it's either a startup or you think maybe you know a spinoff. So, yeah. but you guys did this the ragtag um, from the ground up kind of way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we, I think, I think it's like I'm kind of glad to hear you say that though because I, we uh, we so even since the beginning, like we always try to like appear that we were like that it wasn't a rag tech thing, bigger right? like, than you uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it wasn't because not because we we're trying to dupe anybody but we we're you know because we want to we're, this is a real business this is not like we're not run this isn't run out of a garage this isn't like we're not we're not we're not guessing at, at what we do uh, anymore at least we did a little bit <laughs> in the beginning but sure. um you know uh and so that was you know that's important to us to like you know we put a lot of work behind the design and the brand and the image and the feel of everything so i like hearing that very cool so your history is starting small um fishing what what Everybody here fishes or yes. sp oh, yeah. multi-species. Um, yeah. Are we all East Coasters from this area, Boston yeah. area? Yeah. So, so, so we kind of have like this is a somewhat incestual group. So, um, so <laughs> all right, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we all are from here, um, and we all kind of in one way or another knew each other before working together. So. Aaron was actually, who was our first um, employee, uh, who's been on for about two years now, was actually a customer, um, and just popped in the office one day, and we started talking, and a couple weeks later, she had a job, uh, and uh, Ben, I had met at some uh, fly fishing trade shows um, over the years, and he told me he was looking for something new, and then they same story, a couple weeks later, he had a job. And um, then Greg, I actually went to college with Greg, so we've known each other for a while and been good, good buddies for a while, and uh, he was looking to make a change, and we had a need uh, for someone to help organize things a little bit on the operation side, and so, and so he was the guy. And, uh, so we've, we've all fished together, um, and we all have, like, a, we all have a, a very deep passion for it, um, which I think is what, I think that's what actually comes through, like, in the product and the service that we provide. It's like, it's not a bunch of people that don't, want to fish or know how to fish or aren't excited about fishing like this is what we live I mean we live to do it um, every every second that we can manufacture when we which aren't very many seconds but when we can get a second to go out and go fishing we're, we're usually taking advantage <laughs> I'm, of it I'm getting this recurring theme so let me yeah, ask, it's, it's, let it's me ask the question if you um, if you lose the pulse on the fishing um, you lose the pulse on everything right so you actually have to stay involved in fishing or you'll become a commodity business which right. i think the big box guys that are trying to get into fly tying and fishing they totally miss it like they don't right. know how to advertise they just put shiny pictures of the fly and think you're all going right. to respond to it to me been hard as a is buying things online is i just get here's three thousand flies pick out the ones you right. want and it's like right. no i'd rather go to a fly shop right. Right. Um, and then what i would find at fly shops is they weren't helpful either and this is a terrible thing to say because i think a buddy said there's only 13 independent fly shops left in New England or something like that, or the area? Yeah, they fall, they get knocked over quite frequently now. Yeah. They're not, they, they're not necessarily sustainable. And I love small businesses, but when I would go to them and I would say, what's what's working, what's biting, what's going on, they'd be like, well, we haven't gotten out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but it, you're not going to pay a premium without a service. Yeah. And I think that it's a, it's a, it's a scary area, but you're kind of filling in that niche yeah. by being, you know, 
be service, you'll be um, species specific, you'll have information. So it's kind of, it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm going to make sure that my wife hears that so that fishing is we critical to, go. <laughs> to the business. No, no, I, I think it, it is. is. I told you it was, I told you it was research and development. Uh, I think that's the first thing. Put in the banner. <laughs> but, the banner. but, you know, one, so one way we kind of supplement that if we can't go out, get out and fish on our own, like we have a network that fairly extensive network of both guides and um, what we call ambassadors that that are going out fishing every single day and kind of the intel team. reporting back. Yeah. yeah, like an intel team. <laughs> exactly. And and these are people that do it professionally or people that just love fishing and they wanted to be part of our brand and they want to work with us and help us and whatever. So we're able it, it, we're able to get a lot of information all the time on the types of products we should be using and the flies that are working in certain areas and what have you, even if we don't actually get out to do it. But um, Well, that's that's okay. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that but one day I'd like to be able to get out and do it. You know, that, <laughs> now, what I think that's what the Internet's done is you used to go to the local fly shop, drink coffee with with, with, with your friends and talk about what's going on, and that exists a little bit now, but not, not as much. Now the Internet, Facebook, Instagram's kind of turned this whole into a more virtual and you don't need to, like, you used to have all these, like, oh, that's Lou's brother. I don't hang out with him. I'm not going to that. And there was all this, like, now the whole world's opened up to people you don't know, people you don't have to know, people you don't even have to like, but you can be their friends. One of the important new areas of, of fishing has become community. Aaron, tell us about what your job is and what kind of your mission is as a community manager of Postfly. Yeah, so, well, my main job is to make people happy. Obviously, make all of our tribes <laughs> happy, job. make sure they're taken care of, they're getting what they need. Um, my cable company does not have that person. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. To make you happy person? Yeah, so that's, you know, that's really why uh, I'm here. And, um, you know, part of that is we started a community uh, Facebook page a couple months ago, uh, and we call it the tribe. You know, we have this theme, you know, all of our anglers, tight knit group of people. And um, so we're up to about 1,600 members of this group right now. And these members are, you know, all over the country, all over the world. And uh, they use it as a place, basically an open forum to ask questions, discuss the different products that we have. And, um, you know, what we're finding is that so many of these people are starting to connect off the Internet. And, um, right, that's what the Fish Nerds has done. It's become this weird little subculture of people that have different interests. They don't all fish. Some are scientists, some are researchers, some are, um, you know, work at universities, but they all have an interest in some form of fishing. So it's right. right. Similar? Right. It, exactly. And, you know, these people, obviously, they fish for different species. Uh, you know, they tie different flies. But it's like, you know, the different varieties in there, they're connecting, and they're just feeding off of each other and, you know, learning new things and asking questions. And, they're like I said, they're hanging out offline. They're meeting up to tie flies together, you know, right. it's check out new materials, you know, learn new techniques, stuff like that, and go fishing. So it's, I mean, for me, it's super rewarding, you know, that we're bringing these people together over a love of fly fishing, and they would never have met each other unless it was for, you know, this tribe page existing. Right. Now, from a business perspective, I keep bringing it back to this, but is there loyalty back, do you think? is that, That's the hardest part, because they have to recognize the value that you provide while being part of a community, and that's where I think that Facebook in particular falls off, is people just turn it into, like, I don't care who's doing this, I just want to make comments and kind of steal the show, so how do they, how do they, how do you keep that connection between your business and that community? Our subscribers are super loyal. Um, they really appreciate that we put this together. They're always saying thanks because I met this person or that person. And it's just kind of one of those things, you know, you don't expect to, you know, meet a best friend, sign up for a subscription box service, right. you know, get in your flies. You don't meet friends at the grocery store, right? And, <laughs> it's exactly. never happened. Right, exactly. And, you know, it makes them feel like they're a part of something bigger. They can be sitting at their desk bored as hell at work, log on to the tribe, yeah. and now they're with all these other like-minded people that they know and support what they do so and the they talk to. And, you know, for, I think for a lot of people, we're seeing that it's more about the community than it's actually about our product. You know, it starts out as the product, and now they want to be a part of our community, something <laughs> See, that's bigger. That's interesting. That's when your business becomes more than a business. It becomes yeah. an entity, yeah. and um, you hope people re yeah. reward you with that, which in the fishing community, I don't think it's happened so much. You know, people buy lures, the big box store use them and lose them, and then they go buy more, but there has never been that connection. So that's, yeah. that's actually pretty cool, and that's what the nerds have kind of done is build this awkward little <laughs> community of um, people that... I guess I just have to understand, it's not all fly tires, it's 
or is it all only anglers. subscribers? Oh, yep, fly, so fly, yeah, fly fish. All the, the the common thread is fly fishing, but you could tie your own, or you could have never sat in front of a vice before at all. Um, and we and, and we can tailor these subscription packages to you know where you are in that like life cycle. And and you know I think I think our a, a, I think a big part of what we do too is like bring, like bring people that in that are literally just they picked up a fly rod for the first time. Forget about tying their own flies; that's a whole new universe for them. But they've just picked up a fly rod for the first time, and we've we've just created this easy way in, which is you know with no intimidation um, and at a price point that is super duper reasonable. I mean, you walk into a fly shop, good luck getting out of there for you know for under twenty bucks. Yeah, um, seven and, bucks a salt fly. Yeah, I mean, forget about it. It's it's just not going to happen. Um, and and. It, and that is part of the intimidation. Is there's an ec- there's an economic uh, part of it. So we've we've tried to break that down. But, um, you know, another thing on 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 Aaron's um, point about the tribe group, like this is a, we we also didn't plan for this to happen. Like this is a res- this is just a, a really awesome surprise and result of all this other work that we've done. And like she said, like it is one of the most rewarding things to see these people interact with each other in the way that they do and take it offline and we couldn't have we, we couldn't have planned for it we couldn't have ex- expected it and it's, it's happened that way and um you know it, it you were saying earlier about like um you know back in the day you know you may go to the fly shop have a cup of coffee with the guys and talk about what's working and what bugs are hatching whatever and like this is we've kind of created a way to uh, a way for the internet to facilitate that in that engagement um, by using the internet to like have the short, you know, the the, the small talk and, the, and pass the information around, but then also use it for a way to say, hey guys, want to go fishing? And they're able to do that, which is really cool. Yeah, and I think um, you know having the community page, there's also a level of trust. You know, you're not talking to Joe Schmo on some other random fishing forum. You right. know Which that hostile to some of these. Guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> some yeah. of these groups, and that's yeah. you shouldn't have yeah. to. If you have a good community, yeah. people tend to want to be there. They don't stir up trouble, but right. I think that's what tying it to a brand actually gives you responsibility for what other people are saying and right. what you're presenting, right? Other than just pumping the buy our stuff over and over again. So right, right. it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, like I was saying, it's they feel, like I said, it's not just Joe Schmo. They're like, okay, this person, they're a subscriber, they're here. You know, I can almost trust them more because, you know, they're linked to Postfly and they know what it's all about and it's an icebreaker too, right? Yeah, it's, it's like, like a common thread common yeah. ground to start on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You you walk into it and it's not like walking into a room of strangers. Right. You know these. You know they're they're family. Right. They're a part right. of the tribe. Right. right. You know. So. Nice. You know, the, we were saying earlier how there's always there's been this stigma. Like, and I go back and I think like when I was a kid, like. Yeah, I'd see like the Orvis catalog on like, you know, my grandpa's, you know, coffee table or whatever. Yeah, it's old man with the flannel and the and the and the and the golden retriever or whatever. And you know, it was just never appealing to young people. And there's this cool thing going on now where there is a huge insurgence of young people coming into the sport. Um, and I think it's direct I think the internet is responsible for it. Totally. Uh, social you know, Instagram, social media, like just just the idea of like taking being able to go out, you know, getting off of an Xbox, for yeah, example. Yeah, I think it's going outside. And, and, and yeah. being in nature, doing something do, outside. Doing something. Yeah. And then, like, the, the the prize, though, is, like, the most amazing photo. It's easy to get these amazing photos because the fish are beautiful and the scenery is beautiful and everything. And so you get to take this amazing photo and you get to rub it in with your buddies. And, of course, <laughs> they want to do that because yeah. it's fucking awesome. Oh, it's That's nice. what it's all about. It's all right. It's like yeah. so people go fishing to get the Instagram picture. Like, that is the incentive for people to go. So that's... I think we like. I think we've entered this industry at a time where this is the only time where this business would have worked. Five years ago or ten years ago, there's right. no way this would have worked because there just weren't enough young people that would have understood our model to actually make this a sustainable business. All right, so I'm a I'm a person at home listening. I don't tie flies. I might fly fish a little. I think that's kind of our. We get fishermen that will do a lot of spinning. Have a fly rod. It's usually you know it's an old eagle claw or something. It's got the click and you know and, and they're like, well, I want to use that, but I don't really know how to get involved. And I think that's true of any sport. Um, they go to your site. They go to your materials online. What 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 kind of 
way can we coax them into kind of getting into subscribing? Like, they're beginners, they haven't tied, they might not have a vice. I think that's usually yeah. a big thing. So what, all right, I, I want to do this. What would they What would they do or what's their journey to become involved in the community? Yeah, so first thing, before even like looking at our products, like go check us out on Instagram, go check us out on Facebook. Um, I think our Instagram tag is at postflybox. If you type in postfly on Facebook, you'll, you'll find us. And, and let our customers show you what they've done, right? Like we don't, I don't want to tell you what you should do or what we should sell you or, or anything like that. I mean, we've got so many reviews and customer photos and different things that our customers have done. And, um, you know, I, I would start there, get involved with us on, on social media. And, um, you know, when you're ready to say, hey, I want to try this thing out, it's, it's super, super easy. You basically just come on our site, you tell us, do you want to tie your own flies or do you want to uh, receive finished flies from us? So that's like the first you know, filter, right? So you don't have to tie flies. You don't have to tie flies. Good. Absolutely not. Um, and um, and then from there, you say, okay, here's what I like to fish for. I'm going to go fish for trout, or I'm going to go fish for bass, or striped bass in the in the ocean, or what have you. Um, and then we do the work of putting together a kit of flies. So each month, that's uh, the kit's going to change. It's usually on the freshwater side or on the trout side. It's usually six to ten flies. Uh, saltwater, four, five, six flies. Bass, same thing. Four, five, six different flies every month. Um, and uh, they're all chained, they, they rotate seasonally, so we, we, we kind of pay attention to um, any sort of, uh, if we're talking about trout specifically, any sort of hatch patterns, um, what time of year it is, where in the country you are, that type of stuff. And our goal, and I think Ben said this, but like, our goal is to get you that box and allow you to throw it in your truck or the back of your car or whatever and literally take the black box with you fishing because it will have everything you need. You'll have the flies. A leader goes into every box, so you have a leader that's sized appropriately to whatever flies you got. And then we do like a bonus accessory, which could be fishing-specific stuff. So it could be uh, strike, strike indicators or floating yeah. or, um, or uh, nippers. nippers. Um, and then we do like other fun stuff like we'll do koozies and bottle openers and we'll do um uh like we did a microfiber sunglass wipe a couple months ago which was which was pretty popular so you kind of then you kind of get some like fun in um ancillary uh products toys, uh, yeah, right? yeah yeah toys exactly with it um and but yeah that's the goal it's like get the box and be able to go fishing right away and we do a print we do kind of a newspaper inside it every month that explains to you what the stuff is so it's like oh look at these new flies i maybe i haven't seen this one before there's going to be a, there's going to be information or a tip or some sort of advice about those flies in the newspaper so you can yeah. say all right i should maybe rig this as a dry dropper um, rig and maybe i didn't know how to do that before and we're going to teach you how to do that um yeah or it's, it'll tell you like when to throw it like what time of day what conditions right. you know what what you should be looking for with your fly selection to be able to actually catch fish mm. right and, and throw the flies at the right time right and in the box too there's also some fun stuff like there's a brand new sticker that we designed custom for everyone you guys got a lot of cool stickers yeah I mean, every, every <laughs> which is stickers, important I mean. except my wife on my truck <laughs> yeah, <not a> sticker, <laughs> yeah i like stickers. my truck's covered in stickers <laughs> you know, all of our subscribers laptops are covered in stickers water bottles yeah. are covered right in right stickers, it's so just fun you never have enough stickers i think to go back to that too one thing you didn't mention brian was our blog and oh yeah, Ben yeah, does an absolutely point. fantastic yeah. job managing and creating all the content. Sorry, on I forgot our blog. about it, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> that, what's it called? The Wade. The Wade. The Wade. See, the that's Wade what blog. that's that yep. was my introduction was the blog and the content because I'm a content guy. So, but I did assume that it was just for fly tires, which I am just not, just you know, part time. Very rarely because I don't tie as good a quality as I buy, to be honest. But um, it is fun, and I do have all the kit. But yeah, it was the content that. Yeah. Kind yeah, of so we have a, a running blog that's that we post three articles a week. Um, sometimes it's you know fly tying how to videos, uh, recipes like that for flies. Um, sometimes it's just tactics and skills articles. Um, so like how to fish a new uh, technique, like how to rig a dry drop a rig, or or how to find you know pre spawn bass in the spring or something like that. You know very defined tactics like that. And then there's other fun stuff like you know videos about about who we are, you know, behind Postfly and, and kind of little bios of us. Um, fun things like, uh, you know, seven reasons you don't fish enough or excuses to, to ditch work and go fishing. You yeah. know, fun, fun stuff like that. Fun content that you can read every week. So you've got a dream job just building content for fishing. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty much. Nice. Well, 
was going to say, let's talk about what you do for fun, but it sounds like you work for fun. This yeah. is point. Near. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I, and I think that's actually the, we literally work for fun. I mean, we have days that we, listen, we have days that suck. You know, we have, we have dead, you know, we, <laughs> we get real close to deadlines a lot. Um, and, and Do you deal people with sweat the post a lot. office or? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, we'll, we have a lot of inventory coming in um, that is critical, like the flies. Um, that if they're not here by a deadline, it, you know, everybody's, everybody's a little bit nervous. And so we have days that are, are a little bit crazy, but we have a lot of fun days. And like, and the, the more, the, as the business grows, like the more fun we're having and the tribe community thing is a, a great example of that. Like that is something that we didn't plan on. That was just like, you know what? I, you know, we think this would be kind of cool. So let's try it. And it's creating a lot of really cool opportunities and, and, and some fun things. But well, and the culture is fun here too. I mean, yeah. We're all young. We're all basically the same age. So yeah. So it's fun to come so to work here. Yeah. We all appreciate it. That's what she said, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly. Uh, sometimes, like every day, we drink beers. You know, after yeah. three o'clock. So you know, there's yeah. Uh, you know, there's yeah. There's a, we we don't take we don't take it. I don't want to say we don't take it too seriously because we take it very seriously, yeah. but think, we know how to enjoy coming yeah, to work. I think we take the business seriously. Like, we want to provide a good service to the tribe, to the subscribers, you know, but we don't take ourselves right. too seriously. So, right. we, we know how to have fun while we're working hard. I think that's, that's kind of the key, doing both at the same time. You have to stay sane. Um, and just one other thing that I like to talk about, I don't know if you guys have a connection, but conservation, are you involved with any concert? I see a Casting for Recovery sticker. Yes. Um, how does that play in? Uh, do you find business through conservation? Do you approach that or not something that... Yeah, so um, there's multiple angles. So the Casting for Recovery thing, my mom's actually a breast cancer survivor. So I was uh, actually five years this month, uh, uh, cancer free, which is pretty awesome. Wow. But, um, so I was naturally drawn to that organization. Just right, from, I said, whatever we can do, can we support you. And, and we did some. Um, we did a uh, a really cool thing where we had a kit of um, like pink themed flies created and um, donated the proceeds. Right, to, the, to fish, those. the yeah. fish nerds did the yeah. same thing. Yeah, the um, pink flies. Yeah, so that so that was fun. And then we work uh, with Trout Unlimited. Uh, we're a Trout Unlimited business, and we're happy to support them. And um, we are in the process of expanding our relationship with Trout Unlimited that is going to be, you know, you had mentioned, is there an angle that it helps our business from just from a, a gro- you know, a growth perspective? So we're working on some things with them that are going to accomplish that, but also allow us to be more involved on their conservation efforts, right, right. getting a uh, product or, or, or um, uh, providing value, I should say, to their membership, um, which is... Because community is, now yeah. seems to extend into, the fishing community seems to be going that direction. Like, right. it's not just using resources now there's enough people that you have to protect them in right. some way and we yeah. all do it our own way I, I, I'm a TU guy I'm, yeah. I do everything I can but there's only so much you can do but I think now like I buy my stuff from businesses I trust to do the right thing some of the time you know it's a, right. obviously right. you can't do it's not a perfect world but I have Patagonia is the big one that comes to my mind I'm always like you know, they're building a conservation yeah, business sure. based on really expensive retail right. goods. I'm yeah. okay with that, you know, yeah. um, which is kind of cool. But I just see that as the progression, and you're already in it. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we, we try and touch on that on the blog uh, every once in a while, uh, you know, talk about conservation, um, you know, current campaigns that are going on right now that you can help out with and sign petitions and, and kind of fight bills that are just so very clearly against, you know, Right, conservation uh, in, in terms of like yeah. anglers and fishermen. Trying to keep it apolitical because I know we all have <laughs> we all have our views, right, but yeah, conservation like, should be. It's hard to walk that line. Yeah, I yeah. do that with the blog. Like, we don't want to be political, but we want to make sure that like, right. you know, our it's, fisheries are protected. We want to have places yeah. to fish. Like, exactly. That's, yeah, at the end of the day, like we gotta have whatever side of the spectrum you're on politically. Like, if we want to keep doing this, if we if you, if you are a business in the fishing industry or the outdoor industry or you're a consumer in those industries. We all need a place to go enjoy this stuff. If you're a hiker, you need a place to hike. If you're a fisherman, you need a place to fish. If you're a boater, you gotta have a place to boat. And um, so that's you know that's. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we have to not think of our government <laughs> entities as being the ones that are gonna do this. It's no, we have to. The, do, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be the businesses, exactly, the people, yeah, and, the, yeah. and the conservation organizations. Totally. I think, which is I, a, I think a different so too. paradigm than, than we yeah. may have had. Yeah, it's a paradigm shift. One that's thing sure. that we do do a lot of, <clears throat> unlike you know Patagonia, we're a small startup. We can't donate ten million dollars, you know, from Black. <laughs> 
Black Friday. Friday. <laughs> um, which is wonderful, but it is very easy for us to donate product. And we, I get requests from TU chapters and, you know, right, yeah. you know, 12, 15, you know, different. Day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it is. And, you know, we, yeah, so. we really donate a lot of product to these for their banquets and, you know, raffles and all the things that they yeah. do do. And, um, so we try to support them the best we can. So someday we'll hopefully be able to donate yeah. 10 million. All right. So you've got a, you've got a stable base of customers. You've got a brand, you've got an image, you've got all the pieces in place. What's the future of Postfly? Um, so the immediate future uh, is to, as a brand now, bridge the gap between online and offline. So we've, had, we've, we've created a way for our customers to do it with each other, and now that's kind of a mission of our own, to say how do we, how do we really interact with people more offline as a brand. And so um, we've uh, expanded our, um, our office space where we are now to actually be able to um, open a kind of a... a call it a store slash showroom slash hangout, the hangout spot, space slash community community center thing. for fly fish. So we, we're, we're, we're trying to create a space where people can come in, learn about product, fly fishing products, use those products and test them and get to know them. Also, obviously buy them. This is a business. We want to sell stuff. Um, but we want, we, we're going to do it in a very, very unintimidating way, um, in a way that in a way that makes people gravitate to actually want to come in here and spend time and, and learn the, about these new products and learn and fly tying materials, for example, or um, or uh, you know new rods or new reels or whatever the products are, um, use the stuff and, and be comfortable with it. And, and you know, um, and if they buy it from us, wonderful. That's that would be a great uh, outcome for us. But. Um, and it'll also be a space where we can teach uh, events. You know, we can teach casting clinics. We can teach uh, tying clinics. Um, we can do simple things like movie nights. Aaron, Aaron who runs our uh, our community, um, uh, you know, has done this type of stuff in the past. And now we're actually going to have a dedicated space to do it, which is just like non-intimidating, just comfortable stuff for people that want to be part of this community. And that's, you know, that's going to be the goal. So that's our short term. Which is fascinating because that's the old idea. The tackle shop just refreshed or rebooted, right? I mean, again, it's the gathering place, the connection, products are available. Right. But in a commoditized world, that's gone away. You just walk to the aisle and pick out yeah. your stuff and then right. it's lost all that community, which is... You grow up fishing with your family and friends. It was a big part of your life. It was it was social, and it's not just sitting on a bucket. Yeah, <laughs> Although yeah. some people do, but it's uh, you know it's not just drinking beer sitting on a bucket. It's a whole big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think that's what our our goal is to really stay away from. Like we're not going to carry a million different things. Um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna be what you would probably think of as a full service fly shop. Um, we're gonna we're gonna carry the products in in. In services that we believe in and that we believe will pro provide value to our customer base um, and that are at the right price and the right quality to, you know, to, to, to make sense. You know, we, like I said at the beginning, this isn't a business that was built to uh, support a fishing habit. This was a business built to grow a business. So the money that we make on this business goes back into the business to grow the business. And that's, and that's how we're able to do these things. So if someone were to want to get involved with the Postfly Tribe, what would they do? Where would they go? How would they go about starting their, their journey, more or less? Yeah, so there's a few different ways. Um, uh, first great thing to do would be go check us out on Instagram or Facebook. Our tag on Instagram is at PostflyBox, and then if you just search for Postfly on Facebook, you'll find us. Um, you can read all about our products and see reviews and things like that and see stuff from our customers. Uh, our website is www.postflybox.com. Super easy to sign up for a subscription. Um, you create a profile. It's going to ask you what you fish for, and we create the box for you and get that out to you every month for 19 bucks a month. And if you have any questions, um, we're always around, available to answer phone calls. Our phone number is 888-310-3357. Our uh, general email inbox is just info at postflybox.com. So any questions you have, you know, feel free to reach out. And starting um, about mid-May, if you're in New England um, and up in our neck of the woods, we are located uh, just about a mile south of the Newburyport traffic circle right on Route 1. Um, we'd love to have you come by, have a beer or a coffee or whatever your beverage of choice is, and check out our uh, check out our new shop um, and, uh, and create some stories with us. So thanks for... Thanks for listening. So, hey, Rich, thanks so much for, for getting that story for us. It's, it's yeah, always so great. Much, so always, much to learn. <laughs> yeah, and it's always cool to, to meet other people trying to find out how to make a living in the fishing industry. You know, it's people like that who are smart, who sell a product. 
<laughs> who can make a living in the industry. <laughs> Those of us who who create um, content creation people like like me, uh, we don't uh, we don't we don't have that kind of thing to sell. So it's it's neat to see people who are smarter than us doing something. <laughs> yeah, well, they do they do their own content and their own blog, but yeah, they sell something and they get credit card information and that that turns into magic money. So. It, it is magical, <laughs> yeah. So, hey, but yeah. but it's you know it's, it's when you do a, a podcast or you or you speak in front of people and and that starts catching on, it's not always for nothing because the fish nerds have been noticed by the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center and they've actually hired me uh, to come down and ask the fish nerds for a week to visit them and be part of their sensible seafood festival, which I'm really excited about. That's cool. It, it's super cool because like, I didn't think I, I, first of all, it's, you know, you, you kind of create something and, and you don't know who you're reaching and it's really fun to see that, that you're impacting stuff. So they're flying me down to Virginia beach, put me in a big fancy hotel for a week. And I'll, I'm going to be speaking on the Nat Geo stage. I'm told which is this big, huge stage at the aquarium with a 90-foot screen behind me. And then I'm doing, like, these lunch and learn sessions all week. I'm doing in-store appearance at a Whole Foods and a beer brewery. Uh, and then I'm judging the Sensible Seafood Festival, which is a sustainable seafood fest, which I'm really excited about because I love nice. eating food. Um, not actually much else I eat besides food. <laughs> um, but if you're if you're in if your listeners are in, if listeners are in the Virginia Beach area or you're planning a vacation, you may choose to go down um, in the last week of May, uh, Thursday, May 25th, from seven to ten is the Sensible Seafood Fest. Um, tickets are sixty five bucks, um, and I am going to be judging it. So you can you know if you own a restaurant down there, you can feel free to bribe me, you know, because I I need to afford my airfare home. Um, but it, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm just really excited to be like included in this conversation about, um, sustainable seafood And the whole week. We'll be just talking about sustainable fee- seafood. I even get to record live in the aquarium. I get to set up in front of fish tanks and talk to people, which I am. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to get to feed the cow nose rays. I'm going to have lunch with biologists. I have access to all this aquarium stuff and my head's exploding with, with like, what information do I want to collect while I'm down there? How much do I want to learn in that week? But you might not come home. Uh, yeah, except for, yeah, <laughs> I may not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your family's not going with you? No, and that's, that's, kind of the, the, that's kind of the weird thing. It's like I'm excited about going without the family, and at the same time, like, I'm going to be backstage at the aquarium, like, putting my hands on harbor seals. <laughs> like, imagine, well, my daughter's 10. <laughs> Guess. If she got to touch a harbor seal, she would cry. You're like it's so, oh, you're like okay. it's, it's exciting. So I'll be, I'll be uh, thinking about her, but I'll, uh, my family, but I'll be, uh, I'll be having a good time. But all the stuff I'm doing is at nighttime. It's 21 plus stuff, so the family really is useless for all that anyway. Yeah, I, I'm picturing a Homer Simpson like you and the <laughs> harbor seal having a, having a beer together. Uh, hey! yeah. You know, they're domestic at those places anyway, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, that's uh, Sensible Seafood Festival. You can go to Virginia Aquarium's website to Google it up for more information. Um, but yeah, we'd love to see some Fish Nerds fans show up and and uh, let them know that, that you know, you like me. Uh, <laughs> you really <laughs> like me. Maybe they'll social media it up and put out the uh, the video or something like that. Yeah, there'll definitely be live streaming happening all week long. So I'm I'm, I'm going to be there for five days. So we'll we'll make sure that we are all over the Facebook and the YouTubes and the Instagrams and the tweeters and all that stuff. Nice. Yep. I'm not going to Snapchat though. No. Nobody. Yeah. Nobody knows what that is. I don't understand it. So I'm going to skip it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, how about some fish in the news? I love fish in the news. Everybody does. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. All right. So our first story uh, in is from, and my, my website is not working anymore. What is going on? Our first story is from Salt Strong, and it's the truth about leaving a fishing lure in a fish's mouth. Ah, uh, yeah, this is a good one. This is a good one, and and I'm not sure how new this study is. This is April 25 is the uh, 
date of release, but I think I read this story a year ago or a similar story was done, a study was done recently. But basically, uh, before we get into this, uh, this is what the website says, uh, the somewhat shocking and certainly controversial results from a recent fishing study that purposely left fishing lures and hooks in fish's mouths to see how they react. Let's get one thing straight. By no means are we, or the research team that did the study, trying to encourage anglers to casually fishing hooks in lures inside a fish's mouth. Uh, this is purely informative for those of you always wondering what happens when a lure or fishing lure is hooked is left in a fish's mouth. By the way, Rich, have you ever, I mean, as a fly fisherman, you must break off occasionally. Oh, yeah, that's one thing that's really, uh, you know, that's the, the other snobberies about catch and release, but fly fishermen use tiny little nymphs on really thin tippet and it breaks off all the time especially when you get a big fish um so you know you don't want that to happen but it but it happens all they have to do is go under a log and they've got a little uh, nymph in their mouth or something like that so yeah it happens all the time more so than probably spin fishing but um based on what this article says i think they can spit those out pretty, yeah pretty quickly well, so especially if you debarb them which is yeah i i funny when i'm spin fishing in the summer with kids we debarb all of our hooks we do use worms, but we do, I do crimp all the barbs off. But, um, so I, I've seen fish do this. I've, I've caught fish on a very large crankbait and I've seen like smallmouth bass jump out of the water, shaking their heads until the crankbait floats out of their mouth. So they're able to dislodge, lodge it. Cause it, it's a terrible feeling. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fish don't feel pain. Remember? That's right. They so don't feel pain. So there's a lot of reasons to get, you know, we, we all know how we get hooks stuck in a fish's mouth. Um, what the study did was they took um, crankbaits and they hooked them purposefully into pike's mouths and then released the pikes and the crankbaits were color coded. So like, you know, red ones would be in the front top of the mouth, black ones would be in the lower jaw, the, you know, the other one might be in the back of the throat. And they all were designed to float to the top of the water when the fish shook them free. And it turns out um, all the fish, I think virtually all the fish, were able to shake the hooks out of their mouth within 24 hours. They, That's amazing. Even with barbs or not, didn't make any difference. They, it's totally amazing. They can get them out. Um, and and they just would, what they would do is watch for those you know, baits to float to the top of the water and count them. They're pretty, pretty basic study. Um, but it, it does give you hope that, you know, that fish can survive. And it makes sense that they'd be able to get things off of their body that's uncomfortable. You know, you think about how well you know how, you know, you can find your nose if you can't, you know. <laughs> you know if, if a little tiny bug's on you, you're aware of it, right? So fish should be aware of what's on them as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, I can go on stories all day. I was out uh, fishing, ice fishing with uh, Vinny and his family, and we were having a grand old time, and I had my dogs, and they were being real uh, rambunctious that day. They were being, uh, can I say, assholes? Yes, you can um, say it. <laughs> <laughs> especially Scout, so he ran through Vinny's line when he was, you know, playing with his hook, and he got a, he got a nice little hook in his puppy nose. Did he notice he thought, it? Not really, no. He didn't really notice um, so, well, he yeah, he deserved it because he was being a jerk, um, <laughs> just not listening. So put him in the car, called the vet, you know, figured time to get it extracted. But he shook it out in the back seat. So yeah, it was great. I didn't pay two hundred and seventy five dollars. And about as smart as a fish. Yeah, maybe a little, little smarter. I'm, I met your dog. <laughs> maybe as smart as a fish. I think you're right. <laughs> um, what, I, what I also really liked is uh, this article went into talking about what happens to fishes. Do they, like, I, I was always told that fish hooks rust out of a fish's mouth in like 24. I know, yeah. There's so many lies. 48 hours. It's just lies. And that's not, you know that's not true. Um, these, these hooks are, some of them are plated with that red enamel, especially mm -hmm. like Panther Martins. That mm -hmm. stuff will never deteriorate. So no. I don't know where the wives' no. tails come from. <laughs> no, but you know, it's funny. I once caught a smallmouth bass and coming out of its pooper, was a piece of fishing string. And so I pulled the string and a snelled a snelled hook came right out of its pooper. <laughs> Is pooper the what right word? I think it was one of those one of those party poppers. I know it was, it was like and... <laughs> Yes. Well but it, the whole hook came right out. Like he pooped an entire barbed hook out. So it swallowed the hook, it, it somehow dislodged it from its own stomach, and then it shat it out. <laughs> So fish can Ouch. find a way. And, and this is, goes back to, so when I'm fishing with people, kids, 
um, when a fish swallows a hook, I I never try to dislodge a hook deep in a fish's throat or in its stomach. Right, and I think that yeah, as a kid, like Dad always <coughs> never quite saw what he did, but as long as he threw it back in the water, that's gonna live, which might not have always been true. But no, but well, <laughs> some when fishing with kids, some of it is get the fish out of sight of the kids as fast as you can because you know it's gonna <laughs> die. But a lot of times, I'll just cut the string as close to the fish's mouth as possible and let it go. And so this study gives me hope that the fish is going to be okay anyway. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that's why God made perch and sunfish is just for that reason. Just so we can waste them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful thing, especially for kids. And kids never set the hook till like a half hour later. Oh, not My bobber has been going on for a while. And, and you, well, you, I don't know if you've been fishing with my kids. My kids are fabulous hook setters. Yeah, your daughter like slays it for half hour and then goes i'm done yep. i've caught enough catches a bunch catch catches a bunch fish. takes a nap that's it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's her mom yeah i've seen it <laughs> yeah but she sets the hook i mean she feels it she fishes really focused for just three minutes and gets a fish and she won't use electronics she refuses she goes nope i got this and she outfishes me even when i'm using electronics it makes uh vinnie kids crazy because vinnie's kids fish hard for all day getting mad and zoe fishes for three minutes and catches fish and quit. Oh, they, it makes Rich mad too, but not no. <laughs> <laughs> So that's good. So it, what it says is, um, you know, we, we've talked about cutting the hook in salmon on the ice instead of bringing them through the ice. And I guess that's why it's safer to, to, to cut that hook off, let them shake it out. Yeah. Than it is to um, take them out of water, freeze them, get your hands all over and remove their slime. So it's good to know. It's totally good to know. Okay. Our next story is from theexpress.co.uk. New school of thought, fish pool knowledge to solve everyday problems. Uh, fish put their heads together so that they can solve problems as a group, a new study has suggested. This is a study on sticklebacks. By the way, sticklebacks in science cl- comes up all the time. I think they're one of those fish that are really easy to keep, like mummy chogs. They just don't die. And they live spine stickleback. Yeah, and they live in like brackish water, really hot water sometimes. I think they can handle some pretty uh pretty rough situations. So they're the cockroach of the the, the freshwater the sea. The cockroach of the sea. I'm not sure they're freshwater either, but um I think they're brackish. I'm not sure though. Have you eaten one? Uh no, we weren't able to find sticklebacks. Although they are on the New Hampshire fish list. Uh, by studying stickleback, scientists at the University at, of St. Andrews realized that the more experienced fish would teach the less experienced ones in a group, and together they would complete tasks more easily. So they had these fish, and, and I guess they were training them. Did you read this story? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And all I could think about is it's weird to me why fish school together, mm-hmm. um, because I would think they'd be territorial, but... You do find, especially with trout, when you find one, you find more than one. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, I think they're like dogs. They like to compete for the food together, and they get each other riled up and stoked up. And I, and that's usually why when you catch one, you catch more than one, right? That's I started right. to think about that. They're watching each other. Like, what's that guy doing? Was that guy getting some food? Hey, you know, all right. Did he get a hook in his face? I got to watch this. So, and, Yeah, I'm not sure they recognize the hook thing, though. They never seem surprised <laughs> when their friends get caught. Uh, so the scientists found that the shoals that comprised individuals trained in each of the stages, more fish did indeed access the food and did so more rapidly compared with the other shoal composition, which only contained fish trained to one or neither of the two parts of the problem. So they showed the fish, you know, some of the fish, here's where the food lives, and other, other situations they did not show the fish. And when they, obviously they watched and they learned. Uh, supporting the idea that leadership played a role in this, we found strong effects of having experienced members in the group, with the presence of these greatly increasing the likelihood of untrained fish competing or completing each part of the problem. Uh, this was published in the Nature Ecology and Evolution website. Uh, scientists say that they can help us understand human behavior. Professor Kevin Leland, another of the study's authors, said, there may be lessons to be learned for human behavior, too. I love when they say that. <laughs> the, the yeah. Scientists said this, and then the scientist the quote comes up. Uh, business institutions already make good use of teams with diverse skill sets, and the natural world might provide further inspiration for how these groups might put together uh, and be organized. Um, interesting thing about this to me is, like, whenever I think about like large groups of fish, like you're saying, like one fish finds the food, the rest follow behind, or one fish finds a path through something, the rest follow. It, it it's like science to prove. And I hate to use the word common sense, 
but it's like proving things that are kind of intuitive. We kind of already know this happens. We already know that when once one fish finds a pile of food, they all pile in. Uh, you see it in seagulls. One gull finds you see a it in food. Every, everything. Uh, yeah. Right? Oh, I mean, oh my even, my even chickens, people. people. Yeah. I mean, we all go crazy. Um, um, well, with people, you see it with shopping, right? You create scarcity, and everyone wants that thing that's hard to find, and yeah. one person figures out how to do it, and it it goes viral. So, fish aren't that different. I guess we learned from this. <laughs> right, which might mean they're a little smarter than we thought. They might be. Might be. All right, we're running low on time, so we're going to move this show forward. Hey, how about a little bit of uh, Facebook theater? Uh, I've been I've been waiting for this and not uh, quite sure what to expect. All right, so uh, to get a little background, Rich, uh, you're an admin on our Facebook page, and you posted a video of a brook trout that you found stranded in a puddle of water in New Hampshire. And you didn't bother to capture that fish and return it to another river, right? Yeah, I mean, I was. it was a river that had been flooded earlier in the year. It created a rivulet or whatever you want to call it off to the side, a channel. And then it, it stopped and it dried up a little and there was a puddle. And it seven, eight, nine inches deep. It's a big puddle. But in it was one wild brook trout. And it was, it was awesome to see because I didn't know they were there. And uh, I got some video of it. And I was so excited. But my brain said, do I pick it up and put it in the main stem of the river? Or do I let nature do what nature does? Um, and I decided it's natural. That's food for a bird. That's, you know, life. He might survive there. Who knows? The water might feed the... the uh, who knows? So I left it. Uh, which I did it on purpose, right? Consciously. And you posted the video up on the Fish Nerds Facebook page, and most people were pretty positive. You know, like, "Hey, wow, that's really cool! What a great fish! That's my favorite fish." But then we yeah, had yeah. one fan uh, who was not okay, and so we're going to do a little bit of uh, of uh, Facebook theater. Now we're going to have to do some acting here, Rich. Yes. Now you can either be this person. All right, and and do his voice, or I'll do his voice, and you could be the voice of everybody else. All right, I'll be everybody else. You're gonna be everybody. So I'm gonna be our friend, and we're gonna change his name, uh, so that we don't hurt his feelings, because he's very <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> so we're gonna call him Pete, and everybody else, you can use their real first names because they're all friends of our show anyway. So. <laughs> I don't know. If, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to totally screw this up. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if Pete is our friend or not, but uh, he comes on. So, so I'm I'm going to be Pete. So if you hear me talking, he's Pete talking, and I'm going to do his real voice because I talked to him and I know what he sounds like. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Um, you said it's your favorite fish and didn't save a stupid thing. Stupid thing I've ever heard. Uh, moving fish from one water body to another is illegal in New Hampshire. You're a clown, Y-O-U-R. Wow. You're with an apostrophe, not Y-O-U-R, so the correct sentence is, you're a clown with an apostrophe. Hope that helps. Take your Zebco and go fuck yourself. Hmm. <laughs> 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 cool history of Zebco, if you are interested. It means Zero Hour Bomb Company. They used to make military supplies prior to making fishing equipment. Why are you so hostile? <laughs> okay, Wormza. <-er. laughs> I don't need the grammar <laughs> bull from a guy who uses a spinning reel upside down. Not hostile at all. So go back to your native eastern trouser trout and finless browns and save a fish next time. It's just like catch and release. That's fantastic news. I am also irritated by upside down reels. It makes me crazy. So at least we have that in common. Not sure what a trouser trout is or a finless brown, but I am super interested in catching those next. What flies do you use, and do you follow fishing regulations in your state, or do you make them up as you go? Well, it's a wormser. We do appreciate your opinion. We will be discussing this very issue on tonight's show. Feel free to call in and leave your opinion on the Fish Nerds hotline, and we'll use it on the recording. 607-378-FISH. We also love fish and struggle with things like this. Do we follow the law or our hearts? It's a real battle sometimes. So we understand where you're coming from. But just a little sidebar. This is me trying to like bring it back to like. All right, we had a little fun making fun of you, but we're still kind of all fishermen here. So. <laughs> worms are. Worms are. All right, you can be Jeff Dallison next. Yeah, worms are is my favorite Muppet. <laughs>
And then I can be Spencer. Here. I don't see what the problem is with allowing nature to take its course, allowing this trout to be eaten by something else and digested and put back in the earth, blah, 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 or the issue with following state laws. However, I think I'm familiar with trouser trout and finless browns, but never targeted them personally. And I, too, am hoping to be educated on what a wormser is. All right. So, so let's be Pete again here. And you're going to hear a different tone now. I hear you on the nature thing. Nine times out of ten, they die of something. But there, I'm not going to get my, on his grammar here. But there is that 1% chance it could be a state record. Know what I'm saying? I'm going to follow you guys because you do some cool stuff. Anyway, so we're going to end there. But he came around. He's now a friend. <laughs> and what I really like, I, what, I, what I love about the Fish Nerds fans is at no point did any of us or any of the fans start yelling at him and calling him names or beating him up. Everything. <laughs> I'm wondering where the statistics come from. You know, right. 9 out of 10 die. Yeah. Oh, re really? Wow, that's, that's yeah. good science. If he said most die, he'd be accurate. But, um, but anyway, no one beat him up, which I really like. And I think it's important, and that's one of the tone I've always tried to set with the fish nerds, is like, we're not here to be mean to people. <laughs> we're not looking for fights. We're just trying to talk about fish and laugh a lot. And uh, it, yeah, it, it gives me people hope. people like to fight about fishing. They it's do. Like, oh, man. They it's do. Crazy. And you see it everywhere you go, but that's not our style. And if that's your style, then you don't want to hang out with us um, because we want to laugh a lot. And we don't have to agree... We don't want everyone to agree with us, but we can disagree and have a good time together still. And, and anyway, so that's, that's, that's our show. That's it. Nice. You've listened to a couple of fish stories when you could have been fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you'd like to support the Fish Nerds, you can go to patreon.com and search for Fish Nerds and help us crowdfund this podcast. Hey, special thanks to Rich Collins. You can get him at Twitter at Rich Collins or thirstproductions.com. And of course, thank you to postflybox.com for being part of the show this week. And until next time, follow the code of the Fish Nerds, spawn early and often, avoid free lunches with strings attached, and swim against the current every chance you get. Boom. We made a podcast. Done. Yeah. All right. That's it.